Today we begin a month of grace here at North Point. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, almighty God, we are about to embark on a great study of your word, and in particular, the greatest gift of all, your grace toward us. Father, we pray that you'll open our minds, open our hearts, help us to relish in your favor. Amen. We know we don't deserve it. We could never pay you back. But we thank you for your grace in thank Jesus' you. name. Amen. 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 Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson went camping together. During the night, Holmes nudged his friend and said, Watson, look up and tell me what you see. Watson said, well, I can see millions of stars. Holmes then asked, and what does that tell you? Thinking it was some sort of a test, Watson replied, astronomically, it means there are millions of galaxies and perhaps billions of planets. Horologically, I calculate that the time is about 3 o'clock. Astrologically, I notice that Saturn is in Leo. And theologically, I can see that God is infinite and that we are insignificant. So what does it mean to you, Holmes? Holmes exclaimed, Watson, you fool. Someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever had moments like that? Times when you just overlook the obvious. I think we all have from time to time. Some of those moments make us laugh. Others bring embarrassment and even shame. Well, that was certainly true of me with grace. So much of my early preaching was spent exposing doctrinal and moral error that I had overlooked the most important issue of all, grace. Though I had touched on it from time to time, it was more of a supporting role than the main actor. I gave it a little attention, but not a lot of attention. But I've since learned that grace must be center stage or the entire production is skewed. And let me tell you the moment I realized my mistake. The moment I realized that I had overlooked the most important issue of all. About 10 years ago, I got a phone call from an elder in Indiana, up near Indianapolis. He was asking if I'd be interested in coming to work with them. I had never visited the church, but I'd heard about it. I knew they were a large group with a nice building, and so I agreed to a phone interview. The phone interview went well until he asked me one question. It was a question that stopped me in my tracks. He asked Aaron, When's the last time you preached on grace? I was dumbfounded. I couldn't think of a time where I had preached on grace. And so after we hung up, I went to my office in the building and I pulled off a book where we cataloged all of our sermons. And I began flipping the pages. And sure enough, there were no sermons devoted to grace. I had preached a lot on falling from grace. But I had never preached a sermon on God's amazing grace. I then pulled out a box full of old bulletins, and I went bulletin by bulletin looking for an article on grace. There were plenty of articles on falling from grace, but not a single article devoted to grace. The shock and the shame literally wanted, made me want to crawl under my desk. And from that time on, I determined that I would put grace in its proper place, first place. You see, grace is the essence of the gospel. Amen. That's why it's called the gospel of God's grace. That's why it's called the word of his grace. Grace is God's answer to man's problems. It's what it's all about. And I had missed it. Did you know that God is called the God of grace in 1 Peter 5.10? His throne is called the throne of grace, Hebrews 4.16. His spirit is called the spirit of grace, Hebrews 10.29. His word is called the word of grace, Acts 20, verse 32. And his son is said to be full of grace, John 1.14. Moreover, Grace saves, Ephesians 2.8. Grace calls, 2 Timothy 1.9. 1 
Grace justifies Titus 3, 7. Grace trains Titus 2, 12. And grace strengthens Hebrews 13, verse 9. Let me say it again. Grace is God's answer to man's problems. Well, what is grace? You know, we use that word so much, you think we've got a good grasp on it. We'll say of a teacher, oh, she gave a grace period to her students. Or a politician falls from grace after a scandal. We'll say that a dancer is graceful or a hostess is gracious. Many people name their daughters grace. What do people often call the prayer right before supper? Grace. We use the term all the time, but do we really understand it? On a personal, experimental level, do we really grasp grace? Grace is unmerited favor or undeserved blessing. Perhaps the biblical concept of grace can be summed up as not receiving what we deserve and not deserving what we receive. But listen, there's a big difference between knowing the meaning of grace and grace having meaning in our daily lives. Do we really grasp grace? Do we? I think one reason we struggle to, to comprehend grace, to truly grasp grace, is because we live in a world of earning, right? Everything is centered around getting what is rightfully yours based on some form of achievement. Students earn their grades, scouts earn their badges, players earn their positions, soldiers earn their ranks, workers earn their paychecks. This mentality is the opposite of grace. This mentality is based on my effort, my achievement, my hard work paying off. Grace is the opposite of that. Grace is not merit-based, it's mercy-based. We're not earning anything at all. But wouldn't you agree that's a big problem in religion? If you talk to people about their salvation, a lot of people, especially within our fellowship, point first to what they did. Tell me about your salvation. Oh, I was baptized. Is that really the proper starting point? If someone says, tell me about your salvation, we should start with he, not me. What God has done, not what I do. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, Paul said. Amen. But we struggle with this because we're so attuned to earning everything. Look what I did. Look what I made. Look what I achieved. You know, the older brother in the parable of the prodigal son struggled with that. When his wayward brother came home and his dad threw him a party, he sat on the back deck pouting. He was all bent out of shame. He felt that since he had put in more time, exerted more energy, done more good, and been more reliable than his younger brother, the party should be for him. After all, he earned it. His score was higher. His credentials were greater. But what the older brother failed to realize is that he didn't deserve his daddy's goodness either. He may not have committed the sins that his brother committed, but he was still harboring animosity, jealousy, and pride in his heart. What's worse, sins of the flesh or sins of the spirit? They're equally bad, aren't they? And so instead of resenting his father's grace, he should have rejoiced in it. <clears throat> But the older brother couldn't do that because he had an earner's mentality. Well, the word grace is often used in the New Testament of the favor that God bestows on sinners through Jesus Christ. He did for us what we could not have done for ourselves. He made a way of escape 
through the Lord, despite our utter unworthiness. You remember this picture from several years ago on the news? The rescue of the Chilean miners? On August the 5th, 2010, 33 Chilean miners found themselves trapped nearly half a mile beneath the surface of the earth with very little food, very little water, and very little oxygen. And it, was, and it wasn't just for a few seconds or a few minutes or a few hours. These Chilean miners were trapped for 69 agonizing days. Can you even imagine that? <clears throat> Being trapped for 69 days. Those 33 miners knew they needed help. They were cut off from above, buried 2,300 feet deep, and unable to do anything about it on their own. They had to rely on outside intervention. And when help finally arrived in the form of a capsule, they were eager to get inside and remain there until it reached the top. That perfectly illustrates the concept of salvation by grace. Man is cut off from above, buried deep in sin and unable to do anything about it on his own. He too must rely on outside intervention, which has come in the form of our saving capsule, Jesus Christ. Amen. But we also must get into him, Galatians 3.27, and remain there, John 15.4, to reach the top. Do you see the similarities? And let me ask you a question. When those Chilean miners were trapped, did any of them ask for a shovel? Did any of them ask for a sharper pick? Did any of them radio in and say, hey, you, you rescuers, back off. We're going to dig ourselves out. Of course not. Those miners knew they were helpless. They knew that their survival was totally dependent upon the work of someone else. Someone from above. Someone who possessed greater ability than they had. And that's true of our salvation. We've dug a hole and we can't get out. We're trapped. We're doomed. Our only hope is what God's doing for us. I think we take grace for granted. Wouldn't you agree with that? I'm guilty of that. I think a lot of people take grace for granted. And I'll tell you why I think many people do. Number one, they don't hear enough sermons on it. But number two, I think a lot of people take grace for granted because they don't realize just how deep in sin they really were. They don't realize just how far down they were trapped. And so, spiritually speaking, they don't see themselves in the Chilean miners. In their minds, they weren't trapped 2,300 feet deep. Their rescue was more modest than that, maybe two or three feet deep. In their minds, they were pretty good people already. They were caring, sharing, and rarely swearing. Their version of John Newton's classic, Amazing Grace, went more like this. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a decent person like me. Truth be told, they don't see themselves as a wretch. And I think that's especially true of those raised in the church. I needed salvation, but I was pretty good already. I think that lie leads many people to take grace for granted. And that's a shame. We need to understand that we were all 2,300 feet deep in sin. Yep. Amen. And words like these appropriately applied to you and me. Lost. Worthless. Perishing. 
dead unrighteous. Those terms apply to us. Well, I want to show you what Paul said in a passage that's incredibly powerful. It's found in the book of Romans. Listen to what Paul said in Romans 5, verses 6 through 10. He said, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who's especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we've been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. Notice what Paul said. Here was our pre-Christ condition. Utterly helpless. Sinners. Enemies. That's us. That's you and me. We were utterly helpless. We were sinners. We were enemies. But then grace happened. Paul goes on to say, Christ came at just the right time and died. Sending Christ to die by the death of his son. This is one of the great grace passages. Here was your condition. As bad as it gets, here's what God did for you. As good as it gets. We were doomed. Don't you appreciate that? Can you imagine standing before the God of heaven on the day of unavoidable accountability without Christ as your advocate? No. If that's you, you're going to hear the words depart from you. But can you imagine standing before God, the God of heaven, on the unavoidable day of accountability and having Christ say, By grace, by grace, this man. Put me on in baptism. By grace, he yielded his will for my will. Those people will hear the blessed words, enter in good and faithful son. Paul understood that. Listen to what he said in 1 Timothy 1, verses 12 through 16. Another powerful passage. He said, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him, even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ. In my insolence, I persecuted his people. But God have mercy on me, because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and love that come from Christ Jesus. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I'm the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a proud example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. Amen. Listen to how Paul described his free Christ condition. He said, I used to blaspheme the name of Christ. In my insolence, I persecuted his people. I am the worst of them all. As we go through this month of grace at North Point, one of the sermons is going to focus on the fact that none of us are beyond grace. Here's a sneak peek. If Paul could be saved by grace, we can all be saved by grace. This guy made it his mission to destroy the church. 
He was an enemy of Christ. He was an enemy of Christians. He even arrested them and voted for their execution. Paul acknowledges that. He doesn't run from it. He owns it. In fact, he says, I'm the worst of all sinners. But then grace happened. Look at what he says. But God had mercy on me. How generous and gracious our Lord was. God had mercy on me. Paul didn't forget his past. But he knew that God's grace was greater than his disgrace. And brethren, I'm telling you, we ought not to take that for granted. God didn't have to save us. There was no inherent good in you and me. God chose to save us by his love and by his amazing grace. I want to invite you back every Sunday morning throughout the month of December. We're going to delve deeper into God's grace. On Sunday, December the 17th, our family minister, Tracy Waldridge, will join me on stage for a panel discussion. We'll have some prepared questions about grace, but if you have questions about grace, submit that to us ahead of time, and we'll talk about it. Brethren, I want this to be a grace church. I want this to be a church where we understand it's God, not us. I'm looking forward to this month, and I hope you'll be here at every service. But in closing, let me say this. Though our sins were great, and we deserved God's wrath, He threw us a lifeline in the form of His Son. He loved us and acted kindly toward us in spite of our shortcomings. This was not based on our merit or on the expectation of return. It was undeserved blessing. No one is too bad to be beyond the reach of God's grace, and no one is too good to be beyond the need for God's grace. We all need it, and we can all have it. Are you outside of God's grace right now? If so, why? It doesn't have to be that way. Maybe you're saying, Aaron, if you only knew the things I did, compare your resume to Paul, would you? Have you killed a Christian? <clears throat> Were you ravaging the church? That's what the Bible says about him. Again, no one is beyond the need for God's grace. Why in the world would you leave here without it? God's grace is greater than your disgrace. Believe that. Trust that. If you want to receive God's grace, you can do it. Surrender to him. Believe on his son. Be willing to turn from your past sins to confess faith in Jesus and to be immersed in water. If you'll take those simple steps, you'll rise up a new creature cleansed and on the road that leads to heaven. At that point, you're not earning anything. You're simply acknowledging your need for God's grace. If you're subject to the call of the gospel, don't delay for the sake of your soul, come now as we stand and sing.